Let's open our Bibles together, please. The book of Joel in the chapter number 3. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations. I will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And they have cast lots for my people. They have given a boy for an harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coasts of Palestine? Will ye render me a recompense? And if ye recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? Because ye have taken my silver and my gold, and ye have carried it into your temples, my goodly pleasant things. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians, that ye might remove them far from their border. Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither ye have sold them, and will return your recompense upon your own head. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabaeans. To a people far off, for the Lord has spoken it. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves to gather round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy. And there shall be no strangers pass through her any more. It shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine and the hills shall flow with milk and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters and a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord and shall water the valley of Sidon. Egypt shall be a desolation And Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall dwell forever and Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. Amen. And we know that God will add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. For Jesus' sake, amen. Whenever you come to the prophecy of the Old Testament, 
You find that the Old Testament prophets spake not naturally for their own day, but for the days that were to come. They prophesied of things that would happen in Judah and in Israel. But you know, in the prophecies that were given in the Old Testament, we find that the Spirit of God gives them a great insight to things that are to happen in days that are to come in the distance. For example, Isaiah the prophet prophesied hundreds of years before the Lord Jesus Christ went to Calvary that he would be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And thank God through his stripes we are healed. And if you look there in chapter 2 of the book of Joel, you'll find that it tells us in verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaid in those days will I pour out my Spirit. It shall come to pass, verse 32, that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be delivered. The Old Testament prophecy. Turn over to the book. Keep your hand there. Turn over to the book of Acts chapter 2. And in the second chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles, you'll find that there on the day of Pentecost, go to verse number 16. It says this, Peter standing up, verse 14, with 11, lifted up his voice and said, Ye men of Judah, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. These are not, these are not drunken as ye suppose, saying it is, but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaid I will pour out in those days of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. Verse 21, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes, he said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Thank God we're living in days when the Lord has poured out of his Holy Spirit upon us. The Spirit of God is moving and God is bringing a people to the knowledge of his Son. And Praise God, we're the proof of it. Because God has brought us to a knowledge of His Son. But I want us to look at a little verse and a passage, the third chapter of the book of Joel. And there's one verse I want to leave as a text, but it's the passage that will explain it. Verse number 14. And to me, friend, it's a very solemn verse. This is what the Holy Ghost says. Multitudes multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. What does this all mean? You see, friend, there's a misunderstanding concerning that verse. And I'll tell you why that verse is so solemn. Because whilst it says here, multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision, notice what it does not say. It does not say multitudes, multitudes, that are now making a decision. This is not the multitudes of humanity in a valley making a decision. This is not men and women making a decision for Christ or against him. This, my friend, is speaking about multitudes in a valley awaiting a decision. It's God's final decision. Notice what it says in verse 2. 
I will also gather all nations, and I will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people. And when people read that, they say, listen, God is going to plead with the people. And God is going to plead with humanity to make a decision for him and for his people. The word, my friend, is not that God is going to plead for his people in the sense of making a plea to them. God is not begging men and women to repent here. That's not what the word means. The word is to be translated, execute judgment. God is bringing the multitudes to the valley of the decision not to make a decision for the Lord, but God is going to give his decision. It's a decision by the Lord. God bringing them to wait, to await his decision, his judgment. Look at verse 13. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come get ye down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Let me tell you, friend, the harvest here is ripe for threshing. It's God's execution of judgment. The day when God gives the final pronouncement of his judgment on the people. You know, we live in a day and age that man thinks that somehow he's going to get away with whatever he does. It doesn't really matter. And as you and I look around and we see the wickedness of man and it seems to prosper, and we've been dealing with that, and we'll come to that shortly in a moment in our study here in the Word of God again. But friend, let me tell you this. Man will not get away with his sin. The Word of God says, be sure your sin will find you out. There's the day of God's judgment. The Bible tells us that the son, that, that, that the fallen angels were chained, put in everlasting chains, reserved in everlasting chains, in darkness awaiting the final judgment. And what mankind has got to realize this, though man may seem to get away for a period of time with a sin, God will punish sin, God will judge sin, God will judge rebellion. Man will not get off with his sin. Man will not get away with his sin. Your sin will find you out. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. It's the day when God turns the tables, friend. The multitudes have already made their choice. And now God is going to announce his decision. And that's solemn. See, there are men and women think that you know that they can put God off and you know it's my decision. I tell you, friend, yes, you'll make your decision. You'll make your choice. But remember, God's the final say. Yours is not the final decision. What has been spoken of here is when God brings the multitudes to the valley of decision and God says, listen, multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision, I will gather them. Yes, I'll gather them. And I'll bring them there to the valley of Jehoshaphat and I will plead or I will execute judgment upon them. And you know what they'll find out? You know what the sinner finds out? Just as this is found out here, friend, God saw everything. He saw it all. We haven't time to go into all of this this evening, but let me say this. As I read Joel 3 here, if you look in verses 2 and 3, it says this. 
God gives the reason for the gathering. He says, I will also gather all nations and I will bring them down in the valley of Jehoshaphat and I will plead with them there for my people, for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. And if you look at the history of Israel and the children of Israel, friend, you'll notice the scattering of the children of Israel. Now, in 1948, God brought that little people together again and Israel became a nation again. And if you look at the children of Israel, God delivered them out of Egypt. And you'll find that for generations, yes, the, the children of Israel, they experienced the blessing of God in the land. And then the Assyrians came. And then the Babylonians came. And then God delivered them out of the bondage once again. But you'll find that for 2,000 years, the people of God have been scattered. They have been banished from their homeland. And they were scattered, as the Word of God says, whom they have scattered among the nations. And then it says this, and parted my land. And you know, friend, it's up to date, the dividing of the land. Because if you look at the history of the Middle East, even to this very day, friend, what's the conflict all about? Who owns the land? And the Palestinian says, it's ours. And there's a big battle ensuing. And there's a rouse ensuing. And the world's getting involved in it. Because there's one thing it seems to be. That they want to deny Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. They want to say it is the capital of a divided kingdom. And there's a battle about that. And there was a battle. Because Jerusalem was divided as a city. And there's a part of the Jew could never have entered in. And then there was a battle. And thank God they controlled the whole of that city. But I'll tell you this. They parted my land and there's still rows and battles going on about who owns this land. And the Jew says, this is our land for God give it us. Our father Abram was given this of God. But he says, you have parted. You have parted my land. And so they've scattered the people and they've parted the land. And then notice what it says. Thou hast cast lots for my people. They have given a boy for a harlot and they sold a girl for wine that ye may drink. In other words, they traded God's people. They were sold into slavery. They were oppressed. Has that not been true? Many people tried to deny that the Holocaust ever existed. Millions of Jews weren't slaughtered. And that Hitler and, the, and those, the enemies of the Jewish people, that somehow that there never was a Holocaust, that they were never put in to those chambers and gassed and put to death and starved. I want to tell you, friend, man may close his eyes to it, but God doesn't. God doesn't. God saw exactly what it was doing. Go on to verse number five. It says, Because ye have taken my silver and my gold, and you have carried it into your temples, my goodly, pleasant things. Not only have they shown contempt for God's people, friend, they showed contempt for God. We're living in a day and an age when there's an absolute contempt for God. And the things of God. Listen, ye have taken my silver and my gold. And friend, there's a contempt today for the things of God. Anybody who stands up and believes on the Lord's day, in the sanctity of the Lord's day, you're laughed at. You're belittled. You're maligned. Because you dare will, would believe that there is a day that is set apart for God. Notice what God says. Ye have taken my silver. You have taken my gold. And you have carried into your temples my goodly, pleasant things. And they showed a contempt for God. Now what does God say? God says, I'll gather you. 
and I'll bring you down into the valley of decision. And he says, I'll make my decision. Some things I want you to notice very quickly in this passage of God's Word, friend. Firstly, I want you to notice this, and I want you to remember this, that God cares about the hurting of his people. God cares. You know, we've been studying on the Lord's Day mornings the Psalm 37 about the prosperity of the wicked. And sometimes the poverty of God's people. And what we've been suggesting is this, that people wonder, why doesn't God step in? Why doesn't God move? Why does the Lord seem so slow? God's people are going through painful experiences in their lives. But I want you to notice, just you read this passage of God's Word, friend, and the first thing you notice is this. God sees it all. God knows about it all. And not only is God aware about the hurting of his people, don't you think that God's indifferent to the hurting of his people? Keep your hand there. Turn back to the book of Exodus chapter 2. And in Exodus chapter 2, in the verse 23 and 24 it says, Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 and 24. And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage and they cried. And their cry came up unto God by reason of their bondage. And God remembered their groaning. Or God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abram, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. It said they cried unto the Lord, and God heard their groaning. Go to chapter 3, verse 7. And the Lord said, I have seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. And I have heard their cry by reason of taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And he says, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land onto a good land and a large onto a land flowing with milk and of honey. And God knew what his people were going through. God heard their cry. God heard their groaning. Maybe tonight you feel Preacher, I've been going through hard days and nobody seems to care. Let me tell you, friend, God does. God does. Who are you looking to? God cares. And down through the ages, God's people have suffered. Make no mistake about that. God's people have suffered. Think about Paul and Silas. Think about Peter and think about Peter and John. Think about Stephen. He was martyred. Think about James. He was beheaded. Yes, God's people have experienced suffering for Christ's sake. And you know, as we gather on Mullock Boy Hill tonight, let me tell you, in the world tonight, there's a suffering church. There's a people who can't meet with another Christian. There are people in this world tonight who are suffering because of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet because we suffer perhaps some deprivation or we haven't what others have, somehow we think that we're badly off and yet there are people tonight who have absolutely nothing. No fellowship. Nobody to talk to. They don't talk to somebody because they could be talking to the enemy. And there's a suffering church. You know, sometimes, friend, to be honest, before God, God forgive us. We're mopers. We're murmurers. And we haven't a clue what real suffering's about. We don't know what it is to suffer for the cause of Jesus. We don't know what it is to suffer deprivation. 
You know, in the midst of our depression, we say, does God really care about what I'm going through? I was reading this week Psalm number 10. What did the psalmist say? That's what he said, Psalm 10, verse 1. He said, Why standest thou afar off, O God? Is the Lord seemingly afar off tonight? Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in the time of trouble? Is there someone here tonight in God's house and you say, Preacher, I've been going through troubles, but it seems as if, it seems as if God's far off. It just seems as if God's hiding himself. Psalmist cried, he said, Oh God, why? Why, God, why? Two great questions. And there's a groan in his heart, there's a lament in his soul. For he's in a day of trouble. Go down to verse 10. He said, Here's the ungodly man. He has said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He will never see it. But look at verse 14. Thou hast seen it. Just underline those words, right? Thou hast seen it. God sees everything, friend. God sees what his children are going through. God is not oblivious. God is not indifferent to the persecution and the suffering of his people. But I'll tell you, the word of God reminds us God permits times of suffering in the lives of God's people. For God's people go through great trials and great troubles, even personal afflictions and bodily afflictions. But I want to tell you this, never charge God that he does not care because the devil's a liar. Never impugn the wisdom and the goodness of God. God sees the hurt of his people. And that's what Joel chapter 3 reminds me, first of all. God saw all the hurt of his people. And that encourages me. God knows what I'm going through. I remember years and years ago in a time of a Deep Valley experience, I remember reading a little plaque just on a fireplace. Just above the fireplace in our brother Paul's home. His mom and dad's home. Never forgot the words. And I tell you, this must be nearly over 30, 40 years ago. And I can remember the words. I can still see them as clear as if it was last night. And these are the words. God knows. God loves. God cares. Nothing this truth condemn. God gives the very best to those who leave the choice with him. And friend, you'll get a comfort there. And I bowed my head before God that night as I looked on that plaque and I said, Lord, I'm really believing that with all my heart. I'll leave the choice with you. You see, God sees the hurt of his people. Secondly, very quickly, God controls. Not only God cares about the hurting, God controls the affairs of history. We live in an evil world. We live in a sinful world. We live in a world, friend, to be honest, evil is called good, and good is called evil. All manners of of, of immorality and uh, and sin on every hand is, is about us, and it seems to be that the enemies of God are prospering, and my, the old devil comes in and he sneers at the people of God and says, well, what's your God going to do about that? Look at what's happening in the world. Where's your God now? Let me tell you, my friend, you know what history proves to me? It proves this fact. 
God does something about it. But God does it in his own time. I mean, you try to tell God what to do or when to do it. You let God work it out. God does something. God does not sit back. You say, well, why has God not stepped in? Let me tell you, my friend, the psalmist said, I waited patiently on the Lord. God allows it to come to his head. Turn to Genesis chapter 6. Keep your hands still on Joel. We'll be back there in a minute. Genesis chapter 6. Verse 5, it says this, And God saw the wickedness of man that was great in the earth. Yet every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continue. Look at verse 11. And the earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence, and God looked upon the earth. And behold, it was corrupt for all flesh that had corrupted his way upon the earth. Then go over to chapter 15 of Genesis. Verse number 13. It says, And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. They shall afflict them four hundred years. This is Abram's seed. Afflicted four hundred years. And also that nation, whom they shall serve, will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance, and thou shalt go to thy father in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now, the Amorites were a very evil, wicked, idolatrous, perverse people. And God saw what was going on. And God knew all about it. And I'm sure as God's people were suffering there under the bondage, they wondered, why does God permit this to happen? Why isn't God doing something? Why isn't God moving? Why isn't God stepping in? The souls under the altar cried out to God, Oh God, how long dost not thou judge? Lord, when are you going to judge? I want to tell you God knows what he's doing. Because look at there at verse 16. It says, For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. That's why I haven't stepped in yet. It's not yet full. But then, my friend, when you go on in God's word, go to the book of Joel. Let's get back there to the book of Joel for a moment. And the chapter number 3, look at verse 13. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is right. Come ye down, for the press is full. Yes, now's the time, says God. Never imagine that things are out of God's control for him. Never imagine that God doesn't care. I want to tell you, God's allowing the cup of iniquity to fill. And at the right time, God will step in. Why? Because God controls history. He controls it all. The third thing, very quickly, is this. Not only does God care for those who hurt, and not only does God control history and the affairs of history, but thank God, God will command the harvest. Chapter 3, verse 2 says, I will also gather all nations, and I will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. 
Look at verse number 12. Let the heathen be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I, I sit to judge all the heathen round about. You know, God's judgment is inevitable. He says, let the heathen be wakened, for there will I judge. God doesn't enter into discussion about judgment. God says, I'll sit to judge. You may seem a long time, but cheer up, my brother. God's working out his plan. God's letting the cup of iniquity fill. And then he says, put in the sickle. The harvest is ripe, ready for judgment. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. This is not man making a decision about God, friend. Many people read it that way. Do you know what it is? It's God making the decision about man. Tables turned. Do you mind, remember what Pilate said one day? He asked the crowd, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? Listen, friend, that's not what this is about. It's the other way asking the question, What will Christ do with me? You ever thought about that? What will he do with me? Remember the wee chorus, what will you do with Jesus? What will your answer be? Someday your soul will be asking, what will he do with me? Dear sinner, have you ever thought of that? What will he do with you who have rejected the Son of God, his lovely Son, who went to Calvary's cross and shed his precious blood that man might be saved from their sin? And you trampled under your foot the blood of Christ and you counted it as if it was nothing. Spirit of God has spoken to your heart, knocked on your heart and called to your heart, but you hardened your heart and you turned your back on God and you walked away and you loved your sin. And my, it just seemed as if in defiance you got deeper and deeper and deeper into your sin. As he stood at the door of your heart, instead of opening the door, you barred the door against the Son of God. Yes, you have made your choice. Now it's his decision. And God says there, if you go down very quickly to verse 16, the Lord also shall roar at his Zion the terror of the Lord. Time's away tonight, but let me tell you, Jonathan Edwards preached a mighty sermon on sinners in the hands of an angry God. And as Jonathan Edwards preached that message, men and women sat under the, God, the man of God, and as he preached under the anointing of the Spirit of God, let me tell you, sinners felt their very seats moving and under them. And they felt that the very pews that were under them, it seemed to be as if that they were sinking and they were going down into hell itself. And as the man of God would preach the message, they held on and some of them shouted out for the preacher to stop and to lead them to Jesus because they feared the God of glory. Sinners tonight have no fear of God. There's no awe of God in their hearts. And man goes on in a sin. But here the Bible says that the Lord shall roar out of Zion. I want to tell you this. When God Almighty roars out of Zion, there will be no laughing then. The things of God won't be a laughing stock. There'll be no jokes about the judgment. No, there'll be the awesome fear of God. 
I will gather all nations and I will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there, execute judgment there for my people. And a woman, I want to say to you, beg in God's name, don't treat the Lord as if he doesn't count. Don't treat the Lord as if you can just, you know, I, I, I'll, I, I'll call him whenever I want and I'll live my life the way I want to live it and, well, I'll see how I make it out. I want to tell you, friend. You need the Lord now. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the righteous man has thought. Let him return unto the Lord. He'll have mercy upon them, to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Thank God sinners can be saved tonight. Multitudes, multitudes. And they're in the valley of decision. but it's God that's making the decision about them. What will you do with Jesus? What will your answer be? For one day your soul will be asking, what will he do with me. I'm going to stop there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, realize tonight that we're in the day of grace. They have opportunity. They when men and women, as the prophet Joel said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We thank thee, O God, that thou hast in thy grace taken the word of God so many times. You've used it to be means of calling sinners to repentance. What a privilege it is to be brought to that place by the Holy Spirit where we're invited, he exhorted to come to Christ. We thank Thee for the moving of the Spirit of God when our eyes are opened and our minds enlightened when we see Jesus as we never saw him before, we see that Jesus Christ is our only hope and the only Savior. And then we're exhorted, yet drawn by the Spirit to come to him. Thank thee for the gift of faith. And by faith we receive Christ. Father, tonight there are those that are sat in meetings like that before. They've heard the gospel so many times before, and yet they walked away before. And I pray, Lord, that by thy Holy Spirit and not walk away tonight. Stop them before they go to hell. Please, Lord, save them tonight. This is thy work. I can't save. But, Lord Jesus, you, you can. So by thy Spirit, open the eyes of the sinner. 
Please, Lord, let them see Jesus. The only Savior. If your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, friend. Well, the voice of God is calling. Be in time. Multitudes, multitudes brought to the valley for his decision. What an awesome day. For the day of his wrath is come. Will you come to Jesus tonight? Is there a man, a woman, a young person in the service? You say, preacher. God has showed me tonight I need the Lord. You really do, friend. Will you come to him? Just as I am without one plea, O Lamb of God, I come. There's someone here tonight, man, woman, boy, girl. Say, preacher, lead me to Jesus. Friend, would love to. Will you come? As we sing the little verse, just slip that hand above your head. Indicate that desire. But I beg you, please don't go away without the Lord Jesus. Someone listening in across the world wide web, friend, please don't, don't reject the Son of God. Don't spurn his mercy and his grace. O oh, turn while the Savior in mercy is calling and steer for the harbor light. How do you know me? Your soul may be drifting over the dead line tonight. I sing that verse, Sally, just as I am. Mm-hmm.